This special video was co-authored by Eva Viancourt and based on her doctoral research. That research is supported by UC Berkeley's SafeTrack and the Collaborative Sciences Center for Road Safety. You know what this means. And even if you don't speak Turkish or Chinese or Thai or Mongolian, you probably know what these signs mean too. And while the meaning behind any one particular road marking might be unclear or obscure to you, you generally understand what it's trying to do. All of these signs are trying to tell you who has the right of way. That is, who is supposed to go and who is supposed to stop at that particular point in the road. The concept is perhaps the most fundamental building block of modern traffic control. It's hard to imagine how any of us will get from point A to point B without a system of rules telling us some people to yield so that others may go on ahead of them. And it seems natural to us that some rules should be communicated by signs and symbols on the pavement or roadside. For most of human history, though, that idea made no sense at all. In fact, before the rise of the automobile, the world's highways were practically empty of laws telling us how to move. The idea that you have a right to move forward at one point in the road and a duty to stop at another was all but unheard of. Sure, road rules did exist before the automobile age, like the pedestrian-only zones of ancient Rome, but there was nothing like our modern laws requiring you to signal before making a turn or momentarily stop at a particular sign. There were laws telling people when and where they could move, but not how to move. And then suddenly, in the early 20th century, dozens of new laws appeared which purported to control movements that had never been subject to law before. Somehow, within only a few decades, these new rules were not only governing ordinary people's most basic movements all over the world, they become so normalized that now we can hardly notice them at all. In order for all this to happen, something fundamental about the way we experience law in space had to change. Imagine a crossroads in, say, medieval England. What happens when two travelers going in different directions meet? Today, they'd each have a clear line of direction to follow and a legal rule telling them which line is supposed to go first. But in the medieval world, those lines don't exist. It's up to our travelers to negotiate who should yield to whom for themselves. And legally speaking, they can take any line of direction they please in order to do that. That's because in the pre-automobile age, there's basically only one kind of legal line drawn in space, and that's the boundary line. These boundary lines mark off one block of territory from another and from unclaimed or common land outside. The only legal question is whether or when you are allowed to cross those lines to enter those territories. Now, in the British political imagination, the open road was a very special kind of territory. It traditionally belonged to the king and all of his subjects in common. Consequently, Englishmen had for centuries been jealously guarding what they alternately called the freedom of the highway or the natural equality of the highway or sometimes the right of way. These phrases all refer to the same basic assumption, that all private travelers on public land were equal, and no one could tell them how to move, and no law could give one precedence over another. There were a couple of exceptions to this rule, but in general, the English government hewed to the principle that the state had no right to control individuals' movement on public roads unless the movement was obstructing the free movement of others. So if your neighbor's pigs were wandering around in the road, blocking people's way, you had every right to pull over, get down from your carriage, and kill them. No one, not even the state, could force you to drive on the left or right side of the street. The very idea of a fixed speed limit, British lawmakers said in 1832, was simply insane. This was more or less the state of things when the first automobiles began to appear on British roads in the mid-19th century. After a couple of decades of being restricted to a speed of 4 miles an hour, and subject to rules like automobiles must be preceded at all times by a man on foot carrying a red flag, the car was deemed to be a regular part of road traffic in 1896, and free to move along the King's Highway without any abnormal restrictions. But now the motorists had another problem. Their cars could attain speeds of 40 miles per hour, but cyclists were still ambling along at 8 to 10 miles per hour, and horse traffic at about 4 to 5. Not to mention all those pedestrians who were wandering around the road, more or less at random, asserting their ancient right-of-way to move as they please. These slow-moving road users still dominated the roads in the early 20th century, and as far as motorists were concerned, they were the pigs on the highway obstructing automobilists' right of way. Therefore, the driver said, it was time for the state to step in. But no law can make a horse go faster than it's able to, so motorists had to come up with another solution. What if cyclists, horse-drawn vehicles, and pedestrians were legally required to get out of motor cars' way? Absolutely not, lawmakers said. The natural equality of the highway forbids the prioritization of one class of non-commercial traffic over others. Okay, motorists said, if individual road users cannot be endowed with different levels of right to the road, what if the roads themselves were turned into the bearers of right? In other words, what if some roads were given priority over others? 
In a major departure from the old traditional definition of right of way, our traveler on road B would now be legally required to yield to our traveler on road A. What was being proposed here, of course, was basically a yield sign. It seems like the simplest thing in the world to us. But the London police officers who assessed the proposal in 1911 struggled to even understand how such a sign would even work. Didn't some main roads become side roads when they encountered a bigger main road? How could the legal status of a road change all of a sudden? After all, it is impossible to lay down any rule that the scheme should only embrace vehicles within a definite distance of the point of intersection. In other words, a road law, as far as these guys are concerned, can only apply to a block of territory, not a point in space. In their mind, any sign informing a traveler he is on a second-class road would have to apply to the entire road all the time. And that's because they're still thinking with that old medieval mindset, where the only kind of legal line in space is a boundary, marking off territory. Within that territory, the law is uniformly distributed, like a tablecloth over a surface. In 1911, it seems, most people simply can't conceive of the open road as a strip of territory that bears different legal duties for private travelers at specific points along its span. Consequently, the road prioritization scheme was rejected. Now, not everyone is baffled by this idea. Some of the police officers did understand that the yield sign was proposing a new attitude to law in space, attaching rules to points and lines of direction rather than blocks of territory. And most of them thought it was a terrible idea. A yield sign at intersections, they said, would lead to confusion and possible disaster, would only increase the danger of accidents, lessen or destroy the little consideration that is now given by motor car drivers generally to other traffic. Aside from other basic physical problems like how on earth motorists were expected to read and drive at the same time, these officers believe that the whole principle of prescribing fixed rights and duties in space was a bad one. Who should stop and who should go depended on the circumstances, didn't it? Circumstances like who was moving faster, whose vehicle was heavier, which driver was more skillful, which driver saw the other first, the condition of the road, the weather, etc. Fixed rules communicated by signs and road markings, the officer said, would tend to cause drivers of motor and other vehicles to depend more upon the signals than upon their own observation. This is undesirable, as it's only by drivers realizing that they are generally held individually responsible for collisions that careful driving can be ensured. In other words, these men believe that definite rules for who should stop and who should go would only make intersections more unsafe. Drivers should be reacting to the real-life circumstances on the road, they said, not pondering abstract legal questions like whether or not the road they were on had priority at intersections or not. And this was more than just a theoretical point. Road users before the automobile age really did seem to understand traffic conflict as something to be resolved through improvisation and negotiation, rather than through the application of rules. Just look at how cops direct traffic in turn-of-the-century London. Notice they don't actually seem to be doing all that much. People cross against the signal right in front of them. It's often not even clear what their signals are supposed to refer to, as there don't seem to be any distinct streams of traffic to direct. And most of the time, they're not making any particular signal at all. This makes sense when you remember that not only are road users in this period used to sorting out this kind of thing for themselves, they still believe that their right-of-way means that the state has no power to tell them how to move on the highways. Indeed, before the 1920s, there were no laws on the books that explicitly made disobeying the signals of a traffic cop a crime. So what are they even doing there? Basically, the police officer's signals are supposed to be aids to a traffic's own self-coordination. Traffic cops step in whenever a traffic tangle has become too complicated for road users to sort out for themselves. Police then are on-the-spot mediators because people have not yet learned how to think about the road in terms of abiding rights and duties, those points and lines we saw earlier. Instead, they're thinking about it in terms of spatial negotiation. Each encounter on the road is unique, and no road user has a pre-existing right to take precedent over his fellows. The police officer's job is to step in whenever that negotiation breaks down. He uses the authority of the state to sort out an impasse between individual road users so that a blockage may be cleared and everyone's equal right-of-way is restored. So this is how people thought you ought to handle traffic jams back in 1911 a stop sign, which obviously won't be able to negotiate with individual road users in light of their own unique circumstances, just didn't make sense in this world. You needed the active exercise of individual discretion to organize road movement, not abstract rights. And yet, less than 20 years later, we see yield signs being adopted into law all over Britain, without even a hint of controversy or confusion. And today, traffic law is basically nothing but a complex arrangement of abstract rights. How did this all change? One answer is, by accident. People realized almost immediately that motor traffic moved too quickly for that kind of spatial negotiation to take place. 
but they still didn't know how to think about it any other way. So all they could do at first was try to invent tools to help make traffic cops suggestions easier to see. Thus, the traffic semaphore, the traffic wing, and of course the traffic light. Notice how none of these devices are supposed to replace the policeman. Remember, everyone thinks that sorting out who should stop and who should go requires individual on-the-spot discretion, so replacing the policeman isn't even really an option. These signaling apparatuses were just meant to help people see them better and apprehend his instructions more quickly. The first permanent traffic lights in Britain, for example, which appeared in Piccadilly in 1926, were designed to tell the traffic cops themselves when to signal stop and go, not the drivers. It's not hard to imagine, then, how drivers gradually stopped watching the cops and started watching the signaling aids themselves. As the traffic cop faded into the background, so did people's consciousness of his discretion in sorting out a traffic tangle. In other words, road users were gradually being taught to imagine traffic as something that could be managed by fixed rules rather than by personal judgment. Rights and duties could exist independent of a police officer to confer them in that particular moment. Because there are now independent rights and duties on the road, rights and duties that exist whether or not a cop is there to confer them in that moment, the cop's job is no longer to direct traffic. It is to watch people as they perform these dance steps and swoop in when they mess up. Within a few short years, then, the old territorial vision of law and space was left behind, and a new way of looking at the road emerged. Moving down the public street today is like performing a choreographed dance or playing a sport. The central question is always, who has the right of way? Meaning, who has the right to go first? This is a far cry from 100 years ago, when right of way meant exactly the opposite. Everybody has equal right to go where they pleased. So to wrap up, before the automobile, there were no road rules we would recognize. Each traveler could move freely, so long as they were not blocking another traveler. Travelers resolved their own intersection disputes, and only when they couldn't would a traffic cop step in to assist. Early traffic law recommendations were met with resistance. Individuals were the bearers of right, not the roads themselves. Stop signs and yield signs did not make sense in that system. As cars became more popular, it became clear that they moved too fast for the typical 19th century spatial negotiation system. In response, new devices were employed to make it easier to see the suggestions of the traffic cop. Those devices gradually replaced the traffic cop, and people relied solely on traffic signals in a system of abstract rights. Traffic signals, pavement markings, and the rules of the road now choreograph a complicated dance that would be unrecognizable 110 years before. Thanks for watching, and I hope you've learned something about the history of the right of way. Please subscribe to Safe Trek's channel for more fascinating videos about transportation safety. And thank you to SafeTrek and CSCRS for supporting this research.